Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. I have a really interesting guest coming on, so I think something that you'll enjoy, I know I'm going to enjoy it, just uh, talking to him a little bit about what he's been doing. He spent 20 years working on a book called In Defense of Chaos, The Chaology of Politics, Economics, and Human Action. And uh, he's been a big uh, studier into things like chaos theory for, for decades. Uh, but he, uh, he thinks, and as far as I know, he's the first person who's really tied in chaos theory into libertarian or anarchist thought. Uh, so it's sort of like tying in uh, chaos theory with human action. It's L.K. Samuels. He's coming in from Carmel, California. And uh, he's going to also be speaking at Anarchapoco on this topic, or maybe on some other topics as well. Uh, but uh, we're going to get started right now with you, L.K. or Lawrence Samuels. Uh, and ask you, how did you become an anarchist? Well, um, <laughs> it's funny you, you ask that question because I kind of fade back and forth between uh, anarchy and backing off a little bit occasionally. So I don't always call myself an anarchist. I call myself a social chaologist, <laughs> which uh, is probably very close to it. So and what so, is a social chaologist? <laughs> Basically, uh, sociology combined with chaos theory about how societies operate and they don't operate, why government is probably the worst system you can rely upon, a system that, that basically creates this order. It's just you know, the way it operates. In, in fact, my second chapter talks about boomerang effects, which gets into system theory, which then goes over and examines how governmental systems uh, operate. And you know, and, and my big line is uh, that um, governments succeed by failure, and that's why there's so many boomerangs, so many unintended consequences. And yeah, one of, one of the quotes that I saw of yours is, government in and, in, in and of itself is the foremost agent for destroying order and imposing chaos. And I know a lot of people who haven't heard libertarian thoughts or, or things like that uh, might think that anarchy is chaos and they think that's bad. But why don't you explain why chaos is not only good but actually necessary? It's necessary. It's good. It's, it's a sort of symbi a symbiotic relationship between order and chaos. Some chaologists say... This could have been named, uh, uh, um, uh, instead of chaos theory, order theory, because it deals with chaos and order. But here's the thing. Uh, when you start reading some of the research papers and um, uh, on the um, on chaos theory, uh, like Dr. Uh, Pregogen, the Belgian uh, Nobel Prize winning um, uh, scientist, what he found out, and his stuff is very good He's into thermodynamics and, and uh, and have relationships with societies, how they decay. <laughs> and he said that, that chaos is something you've never done before. You've never been to Russia, first time you go, it is kind of chaotic. But if you, every year you keep going back to Russia, a particular era of Russia, you've created order. Order is nothing but repetition. And that's what uh, Prejan was saying. It's repetition, that's order. Now, repetition doesn't mean it's always good. Serial killers use... Uh, uh, order. Every time they kill a person, it's the same style they use. They have it's very orderly, but it's not necessarily kind of order you want. So uh, chaos is very necessary. If you ever start something, write a book, paint a uh, do a picture, start up a new company, uh, technology never been done before. That's chaos because it's never been done. But you can't have order without chaos at, at first. Chaos has to start. You have to start somewhere. And then after you've done something chaotic, now you can do repetition of it, you know? <laughs> and then you order. So, you, you know, I, I try to break it down into simple terms. Um, um, it's very hard when you read some of these research papers. Um, um, you know, it's, it, you practically have to uh, decode it. Um, but uh, chaos is important, and, and, as, and for a libertarian, that means liberty. The liberty to try something that's never been done before. And again, you can't survive without it. You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have the universe if something didn't first start, something first happened. And you could call that kind of Hayek's uh, spontaneous order. That's you know, a way of, of saying it. All of a sudden, order, spontaneously uh, breaks out. And that's really, in a sense, um, chaos. Yeah, absolutely. And that definitely ties into Austrian economics. Uh, I'm just going to read another quote for, of yours from uh, a, it was in uh, 
chaos gets a bad rap, Import importance of chaology to liberty, and your quote uh, talking about how chaos, we can't have anything without it, uh, was, uh, without chaos there would be no creation, no structure, and no existence. After all, order is merely the repetition of patterns. Chaos is the process that establishes those patterns. Without this creative self-organizing force, the universe would be devoid of biological life, the birth of stars and galaxies, everything we have come to know. And uh, I know I'm not telling you anything you haven't heard before because that's your quote, but that really uh, was an excellent quote as well that I came across of yours that I really uh, liked. And uh, let, let's just sort of mention on the Austrian economics sort of thing, you mentioned Hayek and uh, spontaneous, uh, what, what did he call it again? Spontaneous order. order. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of people relate that to the invisible hand from Adam Smith. Yes. And, uh, and the chaologists know that, the connection between the uh, Austrian school uh, of economics and chaos. Theory. There's a Santa Fe Institute down in, um, in New Mexico, and they have a number of people working for them that, that uh, are, you know, um, uh, libertarians. Um, I forget some of their names, but... Uh, and I quote them occasionally. So there is that connection, uh, 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 very close. To, uh, I, I mean, the closest thing to, to chaos theory for economics is the Austrian School of Economics. That's really it's, interesting that you mentioned, sorry. Pardon? Uh, that's really interesting that you mentioned that chaologists are quite aware of, of Austrian economics. I wasn't aware of chaologists. Uh, what, what, what is a chaologist exactly? Well, just someone who, who you know, uh, uh, Someone who studies chaos theory, someone who's in the field. Okay. And, um, Let me ask you a very basic question about uh, uh, chaos theory. Uh, I've heard it uh, said numerous times over the last decade or so, and it always sounded interesting to me. I'm like, uh, I, but I never looked into it. I don't know what the theory exactly is uh, or how they define it, but it always sounded interesting to me, the chaos theory. Uh, why don't you explain to us what chaos theory is at its basis? Well, originally, I mean, what most people are familiar with is like the butterfly effect. And, and what happened was, is um, uh, Lorenz, Ed Lorenz, uh, um, did a weather program, <laughs> programming, when computers just came out back in the 60s. He was trying to predict long-term weather. Now, does this have something to do with global warming? <laughs> and he said, uh, and what he did was he um, um, often put in these figures to show a chart of how the weather might be in so many years. You know, it just kept going out. And one day he decided instead of, he decided not to put maybe three, he was busy, three additional d digits at the end, minor stuff. You know, it's just number, number, number. And so it just feel like that. And so he comes back to see what it did. And, you know, at first it, uh, the weather is the same as before, but then after a little while, it starts veering off to where it shouldn't be just for minor little changes. And so what chaos theory is saying is that little things have big effects. The, the butterfly flapping its wings in, in China can create a hurricane in Hawaii. I mean, the probability is low, but it could happen and scientists didn't believe it. The idea that little things could, could lead to big things. And that was a revolution in, in the 60s and well, 70s. And then many other things were added to uh, chaos theory. In fact, one I don't think I've talked about is the uh, swarm intelligence, which has a lot uh, to do with uh, anarchy in, in many ways. Um, are you familiar with swarm intelligence? Uh, no, not really. Okay. Well, they always thought, well, okay, originally it, what they did is, is network. Back in the late 80s, some scientists networked robots. I don't know for how many dozens of them or something, let them run around, give them very loose instructions. And they started to be able to observe things and come up with intelligent uh, ideas. Dumb things, many dumb things could, can create intelligence. It's called a kind of, sort of called knowledge sharing, collective wisdom. And so they said, hey, wait a minute. I wonder if this happens with social animals, bees, ants, termites. And so they started looking at it, and they found out, wait a minute, the queen doesn't control the hive. She just lays eggs. There is no control. There is no, no central control, but it's very organized. For example, uh, I use the example of, of termites in Zimbabwe, and they have these huge mounds, and they go down deep. 
And Zimbabwe is a desert, and you can get to 100 during the day and 30 at night. And yet the termites, they gather leaves and vegetation and live off fungus on it, let it grow. But it has to be 68 degrees all the time. So the termites, during the whole day and night, open up tunnels, close tunnels, and keep temperature at 68. Hmm. They even built a building in Zimbabwe uh, some time ago that used that technique. And so you're saying, how can it be super organized? And yet there is no central control. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of sad that us humans are the last ones to kind of figure out how to have uh, organization without central control. <laughs> and, and they can do it. Uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons I've gone in a little on the side. For example, when the bees go out, look for new uh, um, uh, sources of uh, nectar, nectar um, they'll come back and do a dance and, and explain it uh, to people, but, uh, to the other bees. And they kind of vote, actually. You know, you, you can see it on nature programs. They'll go and do its little dance, and then other people, other bees will kind of, kind of buzz. And when you get enough buzzing, then they go off and to the uh, new source. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's very interesting. But part of, the, part of the reason this works and may not work with humans is that these animals can't lie. They're too stupid to lie. So when they go out and see something, they're not going to say, what if it was over there? What if we did this? No, this is where it is. You know, is it? this is it. But humans, because of abstract theory, we are more likely to say what it should be, not what it is. And you know, when you get politics involved in it, you have a lot of that. It should be this. Um, I'm going to say it's this is the way it is, even though it isn't, because well, you know, I want to get elected or control something. And so I think it's pretty hard for political systems to run uh, society because they're always going to basically lie and not tell the truth. But in, in the uh, social animal atmosphere, when you have dumb, many dumb parts going out and examining things, they're going to come back and basically tell what they saw, and it's going to pretty well match. So I have another book that uh, it's, uh, I have a chapter on that. Um, I, I mean, I, I went more into the science on, on the chapter on, on swarm intelligence. I didn't really say uh, as much as I could on what it means to society. You can just observe it. What I did is I talked about the scientists, talking about swarm intelligence and all the amazing things they do. And then I went and <laughs> did, did the second part of the chapter on all the confusion and disorder from the rescue e efforts of, of Hurricane Katrina. And, uh, and when you see how, how so disorganized all levels of government were, how horrible they were, you start saying, wait a minute, these bees and ants, they're much more organized without any central order. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. And uh, there's a lot of uh, companies and stuff now trying things like this, trying to have less sort of top-down control. Uh, of course, if it's a company, I don't, I don't have any problem if uh, an employee agrees to a contract to work for an employer and the employer does top-down control on them. I don't consider that violence at all. And that's why I, I like anarchy is because it's the non-initiation of violence. Uh, but I think there is something to be said for it and a lot that people can learn from um, trying to create different kinds of order uh, through uh, chaos, uh, even in things like business. Yeah, genetic algorithms is uh, what came out of uh, this um, whole, whole chaos, uh, chaosist uh, idea. And they use it, uh, for example, a GM. Yeah, okay, what it is is a way for telling the computer to try to use the best way possible. Don't tell them what to do, just say, solve the problem. And they use it in, in signal lights to try to get them in sync. They use it for robots at, uh, at car manufacturing for uh, painting cars. Maybe they have like five, six different colors. The computer decides when a car is going to come in and be painted versus another car for another paint. And it's not even controlled by humans. I mean, it's just, I guess you switch it on and switch it off. So there's, there's thousands of applications now with genetic algorithms, letting the computer make the decision, low level decision. It's not like, you know, who's going to live, who's going to die, no. <laughs> it's, uh, just, and and that, that's, that's, again, that's part of chaos theory, is that you don't have the centralization control. They're deciding 
the, the computer deciding, depending on conditions, initial conditions, that's what chaos is. Uh, uh, initial conditions, can, um, uh, sensitivity to initial conditions, which means things are going to change constantly, and you better be there able to make those changes. Well, you know, uh, authoritarian organizations can't do that. I mean, they can barely tie their shoes. Uh, and if they do, it'll probably take two years. So, you know, that's where, where chaos comes in. But companies do use um, that kind of system, that kind of structure. Yeah, very interesting. And I apologize to not only you, but the audience. But due to some technical difficulties, we can't carry on too much longer. We can do another five or ten minutes here. Uh, but I'll be definitely looking forward to hearing you speak at Anarchapoco. Uh, LK, why don't you uh, let people know about your book and, and spend a few minutes, if you'd like, just talking about what's in the book. Feel free to hold up the cover there. We'll have a link to it down below if people want to buy it or get it. Uh, and just let people know uh, what the book's all about and why they should check it out. Here's the book cover. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hope you can see that. Yep. And, um, uh, you can get it on Amazon. You get it on my website. Just look around. Uh, I just had put it on King, uh, Kindle recently. Um, it's important for libertarians to know this scientific evidence that liberty does work, that markets work, that, that um, uh, free choice works. Um, uh, you know, I have. Uh, a number of chapters that not just go, doesn't just go into the chaos science, but also goes into sociology, where it kind of shows that that under uh, market like market uh, anarchy in, in a sense, we're not heartless people, that that we're independent, and we're also inter inter in, uh, dependent. We're dependent on other people. They're dependent on us. And again, in a sense like the, like swarm intelligence, the, the bees do make decisions, but it's very social, but they do make decisions. And if you get rid of that decision ability, what you get is group thought, where everybody starts acting the same way, doing the same things, and of course a problem comes along, and they all want to do the same way, like lemmings going off the cliff, you know? They're just going to fall along and fall off the cliff, because they, they don't have the independence. Um, you need, and so what you find in 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 the market is people who are trying to to uh, have the ability for change, the, the ability for chaos uh, to move along with the times. That's why the Soviet Union fell. They couldn't. They weren't getting accurate information first, and they couldn't change very fast. And so, you know, they become extinct. <laughs> and, and you know that. That's why you have to be able to move fast and make those decisions often at the very low level because the low level can have effects at the upper level. So anyway, it's, uh, it's about 400 pages put out in 2013 and a lot of footnotes, <laughs> probably a couple hundred footnotes so you can um, follow uh, some of the research and find out where it comes from and find it on the internet and get some more detail. Yeah, that's great. I'm really looking forward to seeing you down here at Acapulco and uh, talking more about this and hearing more. It's absolutely fascinating and so interesting how you kind of came from it, uh, came at it from a more like a science angle. Yeah. Uh, and, you, and you mentioned to me earlier, you didn't even mention the word anarchy in the book at all. It's not about anarchy, but it, you can see the correlations. No, no, it's not. I think there's only time I, I use the word anarchy and I'm using it uh, to people uh, anarchists who, who wanted to stop free trade, who wanted uh, more taxes, wanted this, wanted that, and saying, these are anarchists? <laughs> I run into them all the time. I mean, uh, out here on, on, the, uh, on the West Coast, you get people who say, oh, I'm an anarchist. Oh, well, you don't believe government should uh, fund the school. Oh, no, you've got to have <laughs> school. Well, what about wealth? Why you got to have government run the welfare? I said, you're giving anarchy a bad name. <laughs> Well, you do live on the left coast, and I do spell California with a K. And uh, so, yeah, there's some uh, weird ideologies rolling around in that uh, state. Yes, it is. It is. <laughs> but it is a beautiful place, as you can see on your video there. So uh, it is too bad that there is a lot of uh, wrong, or just uh, weird thinking people. <laughs> I used to live in Orange County, and there was a lot of libertarians down there. I come up here, and I felt like a behind enemy line. <laughs> Hide in the closet. and. You know, and radio someone somewhere, hey, <laughs> come and get me. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, that's great. Well, when you come down to Narcopoco, you'll be uh, very happy uh, to be surrounded by true anarchists who don't want uh, government to control anything and don't want any top-down control. And they, they believe and they have faith in, in spontaneous order. And uh, so that'll be great. And I'm just going to offer, actually, a discount to Narcopoco for anyone watching this. And it's going to expire on October 31st. Uh, if you enter, I'm just going to put in chaos. If you put chaos as a discount code, we'll give you 10% off of Narcopoco if you, if you register before October 31st. Uh, so uh, if you watched it uh, after that, too bad, but uh, you got to watch these as soon as they come out. Uh, and, uh, but I, I actually want to do that as well because I want to see, I want not a ton of people have signed up yet, and this is what happened last year. And what happened was all in the last month, we had almost everyone sign up. So we didn't even know how big of a room to have or how many speakers to have or anything like that. So I'm trying to incentivize people through the free market, through giving discounts uh, to uh, try to sign up a little earlier. So if you want to get a discount, sign up with Chaos. Uh, really want to thank LK Samuels. I really want to apologize that uh, due to technical difficulties we couldn't do this much longer. Uh, but I'm sure we're going to do it again because uh, very interesting stuff. So check out his book. We'll have the links down below. Like, subscribe, share to this channel. Uh, and of course, come to uh, Anarchopoco this February 19th to 21st. So this has been Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. Peace, love, and anarchy. Conservatives say, oh, we believe in this free market. But I go, really? Real free market? Well, then how about people who are adults being able to put whatever they want into their body? They should be able to do that. Oh, no, but not these drugs. These are bad. Oh, you mean the ones that currently are considered illegal, that weren't before? Well, the interesting thing is, if you actually start performing statistical analysis on this data, what you find is, and the story is consistent, across countries, across states in the United States, across time, individual years, societies that are more economically free have higher incomes, less unemployment, less poverty, things you would expect, right? But it gets better. They have uh, less income inequality. They have less exploitation of the environment, of children, of genders. All these things we associate with good and healthy societies statistically are highly correlated with economic freedom. But the way we think about helping the lot of the poor in society is by thinking more about wealth creation and certainly a lot less about wealth distribution. Acapulco, Mexico. This is Anarchast.